guys for coming out. And um, I'll start by, I'm not going to use a microphone unless there's a problem with you hearing me. I, I doubt that there will be. Um, I'm not soft-spoken, and as Jim said, I, I, am, I am passionate about this. So um, I try and give a, a forewarning that this is far more of a uh, Sam Adams-style um, presentation than it is a Thomas Jefferson. So uh, that's where this comes from. Um, I, I've been on board with the Liberty Movement, probably much, much like many of you in the room, since early of 2009. Um, obviously a whole lot of concern throughout uh, the 2000s, but um, it, was, it really was when, the, for me, it was the stimulus. Um, because you knew right then that the linchpin was in. Um, whatever direction they wanted to take our country, they now had the funds to do it. And influence is purchased. Um, and as we know, they, they know no bounds. Um, the Federal Reserve, uh, debt, whatever, it doesn't matter. Um, they'll buy it and they'll worry about it later. The, ever since I've become Came involved in the literary movement, I've always, um, education's been, been my niche. Um, I work at a small Christian academy. Um, I'm, not in, I'm not an educator, I'm in the finance office. Um, but to me, the whole um, essence of liberty, of who we are, um, it starts with the little people. Um, if we don't embed in them the value of liberty and with every right comes a responsibility, well, we know what happens because we're living it. And so all of these other issues and efforts we do, really for, you know, I don't need to want to devalue it, but for all intent and purposes, it's a very temporary stay on the ultimate uh, destination. Because at least in what I have found, there are very few um, in the generations beneath mine that get it. And it's not because they don't want to, and it's not, certainly not because it, it is um, presented to them that the value and so forth isn't um, valuable to them. They just don't know any different. Mm -hmm. They have truly been brought up in a society um, unlike you and I did. Um, and the reason for that is because of the education system. Parents have abdicated the responsibility the state has basically said it is our responsibility. We'll take over from here. Um, they're just about at your door, brushing your kids' teeth, putting them on the bus, and feeding them breakfast when they get to school. And what, you, what we have now is a bunch of dumbed-down um, students and very complacent and lazy parents and non-engaged citizens. And so unless we get into the classroom, we can't save enough of them once they come out. Um, the delivery movement is static and dies with us otherwise because we cannot beat back the numbers from that perspective. Uh, so as a background, you know, up until six months ago, I was in the chair um, sitting and listening to others talk about what we needed to move on, what we needed to prioritize. Uh, this was so close to home that I decided this, this, this is my cause. This was, Maybe this is what the last three years have prepared me to do. Um, in January, again, education has been my passion. And so I've been involved in the school choice movement and education policy in the state of Ohio, even at, and even at the national level, watching what Congress was doing. Um, you know, no child left behind. So there's for something to, to completely miss my radar and, and to have to be literally a fundamental change and education at a national, state, and local level was by design. And it amazes me to think that they believe, we will believe, that they came up with the best system possible. It's going to cure all of our educational problems in the state of Ohio. Uh, it's not going to cost us anything. And we haven't heard one politician trumping what wonderful thing they brought to us. No one is taking credit for this. It's all covert. We don't have a legislator that prior to me arriving uh, in April after the forums that knew what this was. The only reason they reacted in April was because we burned their phone lines down 
by having over a thousand people attend those forums in April to launch our statewide effort. And they said, we don't know what it is, but we know we've got to do something. They react to that. There is a handful of legislators who were in on the get-go, and some of their names will come up tonight. Um, but for the most part, I, I would be very surprised if your legislators that were on board then, uh, back in 2010 or 2009, had any idea as they piecemealed this in, what, what bills they lend their signature to and affirmation and what, it, what the result was. In January, when I came across this and realized the significance of what this was, I contacted Debbie Terhart. She is the state board president. She is, she is also my state board representative. She came from the Tea Party. We worked her campaign. I thought, how in the world is, you know, is she allowing this to happen? I'm thinking she's going to be my conduit to, to a solution. And instead, I get that typical political responses. Straightforward questions, no answers. Ultimately, it came down to, and at the time, it was a very narrow focus. I was concerned about my academy and what implications it was going to have. My first question was, how do I... How do we maintain our mission and our autonomy from the state with these, with these standardized national assessments? In the end, her answer was, you may do whatever you'd like, but your students will have to pass the national assessment in order to be conferred a high school diploma by the state board. Which my response would be, the practicality of this not putting on us is ridiculous. That substantiates the purpose of a high school is to, is to confer a high school diploma. So the idea that n none of those things seem to spark, I guess, the healthy suspicion in any, um, anyone in Columbus, but particularly of the Republican Party, is astounding. So that led to a month of research, um, contacting the national voices on Common Core, fighting Common Core, um, including the, the lead voice, Emmett McGordy, out of American Principles Project. And site launched in uh, March. The forums were in April. And by uh, the se second week of July, we had legisla legislation being introduced. I believe that's probably record setting. But quite honestly, it means nothing unless that piece of legislation becomes law. So we'll get to the part of, tr of pushing that through I'm going to kind of go quickly through this um, presentation only because uh, even in the last seven days, and I have not had time to update it, this is moving less from a um, historical perspective of what Common Core is into the agenda and the means that they use to get here. Because like all problems, <coughs> unless you cut off the funding source, They'll just redevelop it, repackage it, and resell it. Um, and just like Medicaid expansion, um, that's being repackaged right now. And you know, we, we will get Medicaid expansion. Uh, the story on Medicaid expansion is the expansion started in 2000. But I digress. Um, I call it Fed led because, short, except for the Gates money, which paid for the standards themselves, this the it was the stimulus package that launched Common Core. And they did that through two stages. The first stage was all the governors, in order to get state stabilization funds, had to agree to that they would adopt some form of common standards amongst the states. So that was the first commitment. The race to the top application is where they got into the specifics and where they really pulled it in and tied it up into uh, basically a national movement and national mandate. As all things with progressives, uh, the history, of course, didn't even begin in 2000 with Barack Obama. And that is one of the things you'll hear out of Columbus. You just, you don't like Obama, and so you assume this has to be a bad thing because he likes us. That, I, I don't care whether Obama likes us. That's meaningless at this point. Uh, we have everything we need in the state of Ohio to end it. And that's where the power lies, and that's where we're headed to, to the state legislature. 
But the, there was a, what I call the infamous Mark Tucker, Dear Hillary letter, where he actually lays out a plan that for the most part is 99.5% common core standards. Or I should say the common core state standards initiative because that's where they'll, you'll be able to push back to. These are just standards. They're not just standards. The initiative involves the entire aggregate of what we call common core. This, what they wanted to do here and what they've been able to actually execute through common core, if you race to the top, was truly a managed workforce. The children belong to the state. Their outcome is state determined, not self-determination as our constitution implies. And they do this through the four-legged stool of the race to the top application. Instead of in goal, goals 2000, what they did that was re, that ended up being, and this is what I'm expecting, going to be expounding on in the next couple of months as we work through this bill is the fundamental paradigm shift of where they were able to get their nose and the tent. The congressional legislation for Goals 2000, while they only got about 50% of what they wanted here, they accomplished outcome-based education. You and I did not have outcome-based education. Our teachers knew what was expected and we truly had local control. Outcome-based education is where standards came in. We take that as a pretense. Well, of course we have to have academic standards. <coughs> really? Because it appears as though the outcome without standards is best. We led the world in innovation prior to standards. We led the world in innovation and in outcomes prior to the U.S. Department of Education. But somehow, now standards are, 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 are necessary. They're the entire predictor. <laughs> The reason for standards and outcome-based education is because that's where the control comes in. How do we get teachers to teach what we want? They teach to the test. And who writes the test? We do. So that is the whole essence of outcome-based education. And, and so it's important to know this is not what our education system was prior to Goals 2000 in the 90s. Federal grants I spoke about, that is where this comes in, in terms of they allow, Goals 2000 Congressional Act allowed the federal government, who is not allowed to be involved in curriculum, assessments, or classroom instruction, they, they renamed it and basically said, here's, here's the reforms we are suggesting and that will comply with the uh, Title I funds, and we can't directly affect this, but we can give money to the governors and the local boards, or the local school districts rather, to help them implement their new reforms. That was the difference. The federal grants at this point in the state of Ohio have gone from, or our budget rather, over the last 15 years on education has gone from $7 billion to $15 billion second largest appropriation on our budget, and the federal footprint of that $15 billion has grown from 7% to 20. And yet, here we are with a crisis on our hands still. The feds have bought their way in literally to the classroom, and they've done it through federal grants, and it was the Goals 2000 Act, Congressional Act, that allowed them to do that. Race to the top, um, again, kind of small potatoes compared to the state stabilization funds, but every, every state ultimately but four applied for it. There was no guarantee you'd get a dime. Many of the states that signed on to Race to the Top committed their states to these unfunded mandates and basically nationalizing their education system. Most of them didn't get a, get a dime. The two must-win states of 2012 both were the two top winners, Florida and Ohio. The race to the top application or grant is the, is the framework to nationalize education. It is also, like I said, 
the exact same framework of what Mark Tucker described in order to fundamentally change education in America. There was four things you had to do. You had to adopt this common set of standards, and they had not been written yet, not even in draft form. You had to agree to implement a longitudinal student data system. Now, they'll cry foul in Columbus and say, we've had a EMIS system for, for decades. Granted, you have. But you, the feds were prescribing what you had to collect and who you had to share it with. That all changes with rates at the top. The teacher principal evaluations, you had to agree to that and say how you were going to do it based on the federal guidelines. There was a rubric that gave certain points, and the better it looked like you were going to be able to uh, pull this off, the more points you should receive. And the National Assessment Consortium membership. The two national assessment consortia were also funded by the feds through stimulus dollars. This pulls together everything they need to nationalize education and put the feds directly in your child's classroom. The Gates Foundation has been in Ohio uh, for over a decade. I don't know if that is because Ohio I still don't understand this, is the bellwether state. Um, as goes Ohio, so goes the nation. The Gates has been here since 2000. Uh, Governor Bob Taft was the first one to take money from Bill Gates in 2002. $2.75 million in order to improve graduation rates um, out of the urban high schools. It's progressed from there. He financed the 2008 Beyond Tinkering Report. That is the report that went to Strickland's desk in January of 2009, laying out exactly the reforms that were accomplished in the Race to the Top Grant. The reason being, Gates knew exactly what was going to happen with the Race to the Top Grant, because he was a part of the education reform efforts. He went out and sold it to Obama, and it became a part of the campaign. He knew the stimulus was coming, and he knew what the agenda was going to be to take over education. Because that report was given to Governor Strickland in January, which was the budget preparation cycle, he took that, those reforms and for, for the most part, word for word, put them into his budget. So yes, he legislated through uh, a funding bill, as they all do, and complain about the other. But that is how, when you hear, we did legislate this. This was passed by the state legislature. It was passed buried inside of House Bill 1, which was the 2009 Strickland's last budget. The other thing that they did in that budget that is so telling is they put in there that the state board was required to revise the academic standards. So that allowed them to, to say, whatever the board comes up with, the legislature approved because we required them to do it. Not only did they put that in there knowing what they were going to be facing in order to adopt these national standards uh, and circumvent the state legislature in the process, is they put in there that the, the date that they had me guys, 6.30 of 2010. Now, this is in June of 2009 that the budget was signed. That date of 6.30 of 10 just so happened to be the deadline to commit to race to the top. Or, I'm sorry, commit to common core standards. Hmm. Longitudinal student data system. You had to be federally compliant and prove how you were going to do it. Prove that you didn't have any state laws or statutes currently prohibiting collecting the data or sharing the data. So if you go back through the 2009 uh, State Aid Board <coughs> member, uh, minutes, you will find in there the, all the preparation work that they were doing in order to uh, fill out this application for this grant. And they knew they had, were going to have some struggles in being able to share and collect the data. Because Ohio did, at one point, have um, code that pro protected student data from being shared outside of Ohio and also protected a student identifiable um, data marker. 
Senator Houston, or then Senator Houston, uh, he had Senate Bill 180. He couldn't get it to move. And it was critical because that was the bill that was going to open up the data line. What happened was in the 11th hour, uh, on the, the last day of session of December 2009, he coattailed it onto this generic ROTC bill. It never went through committee on as House Bill 290. It never got vetted within a conference. Instead, it got cut and pasted. Everybody voted and everybody went home for Christmas. There are a number of very conservative rep representatives that voted yes on that bill. And it's because they had no idea what they were voting for. <coughs> They'll tell you that we may not share data outside of Ohio, and that it is not student identifiable. And yet our own code, which was a result of House Bill 290, actually permits the disclosure of person identifiable student information. It's right there in our code. It is law. And it's a law that's a result of House Bill 290. And the reason that he had to get that passed was because the deadline for the application was January 19th, uh, th th three weeks later, of 2010. So they, they were under the gun because another signature that went on the Raise the Top application, it wasn't just Strickland and Deb DeLeal. There is a separate signature in page for Attorney General Richard Cordray, the sign saying there would be no there was no boundaries or nothing to prevent them from collecting the data and sharing the data as outlined in the net. They took it to the step of having the Attorney General confirm that. The third leg of the stool is the teacher and principal evaluations. Again, going back all the way to the, the uh, theory of the early 90s, how do we get all the teachers on board? Well, they can teach through the test, and they'll teach what we want them to teach. And if they if they give us any pushback, or they want to be go rogue, well, their evaluations are tied to it. So we'll be able to get rid of them anyway. They've eliminated any type of discourse. The other really, to me, which should frighten all teachers, um, and this has nothing to do with you know partisan persuasion. This is to me a fundamental uh, right. Teachers are going to be, have to be distributed equally. If you have a very low performing school, then your highest performing teacher is going to find herself there. Because this is all about control, it's all about equal, equalizing everybody. Equal distribution. Everybody, everybody has to do well. And if not, then it's the teacher's fault. So, as usual, with any progressive policy, you're punished for your success. So how many teachers then are going to want to be in the top 10% with, for fear, if they do, they're going to find themselves plucked out of the rural district where they belong or want to be, and, or their suburban district, and put down in the urban school that can't perform. The National Assessment Consortium, they received $330 million between the two of, two of them. For all intent and purposes, they're identical. Uh, the memorandums of understanding between the two consortia to their member states are identical, and their grants are identical. This was just to keep it from looking completely nationalized. They had that too. That was your choice. We had to, as a, as a member state, we had to adopt the Common Core Standards before December 31st of 2011. We had to have full implementation uh, using the park system by 14-15 uh, school year. As another part of that memorandum of understanding, we have to agree with all other states. We have one, one uh, representative on that park board. That's our, that's our membership. And that seat goes to your state superintendent. Our state superintendent isn't even elected. So the idea that we have any representation is meaningless. As well as the fact that Dick Ross is basically a governor appointment. I mean, it, they, go through, they go through the motions of having the state board elect him. But the state board is 11 to 9, <coughs> 9 members being appointed by the governor. As 
well as the fact that I'll throw it out there because everybody wants to act this as a, a Democrat Republican thing. It is not. Who changed the board composition from an all elected state board to a nine member appointment board? That would be Republican George Voinovich. <coughs> in terms of this, this memorandum of understanding that we have with Park is where they pull in, basically where they get every bit of information that they want. They ha we have to, we've agreed to change our laws as necessary. We've agreed to agree with all of the member states as a majority. And we have agreed that we will give over, via this memorandum of understanding which states, we will give whatever data the assessment consortia demands which is, again, part of the design when they say, we're not giving this information to the feds. Ohio law prevents that. You're right, it does. We're giving it to the park consortia, and their memorandum of understanding requires them to give it to the feds. So the fingerprints are off, but the path doesn't change. The destination, it ends up with the Department of Education, who is allowed, since they changed the FERPA law, which protected family educational rights, they can share it with every department in the U.S., uh, every U.S. department. They can share it with nonprofit and for-profit entities. The only thing you have to do to apply for that data is to show that you have educational purposes for the data. They break it down in the rules, or the new rules for the FERPA law, and otherwise, if they didn't have ident identifiable data, how would they actually be able to do a personal intervention? Can't we just say no? And say, well, you know what? This park thing seems to be the big linchpin. If we just get out of park, that'll solve most of our problems. Well, first off, it doesn't because you still come back to the fact that we have the race to the top grant, and that's just one of the compliance points. But the other thing that they put in the memorandum of understanding is that there's three levels to get out. You have to have written, uh, written notice, and you have to you have to state why you statutorily can no longer comply with this memorandum of understanding. You have to prove that your state simply can't, can't do it any longer. All the other member states have to agree to let you out. <laughs> and why would they? And finally, if you get past those two hurdles, your request to, your notice and request to leave the consortia goes to Arnie Duncan. And he'll decide whether you get out or not. That is all stated in, if I recall, recall right, a 21 page memorandum of understanding with the park consortium. So it comes back to if this was such a great program, and this was going to solve so many educational uh, deficiencies we have, would we have to have been bribed to join? Would we be being punished to leave? And why haven't we heard about it? Based education. Again, going back all the way to the to the 90s. That was what they came up with. And it, if they were only working for the right things, these people are brilliant. They do not miss a beat. This, this timeline, when you they haven't missed a single thing. Standards equal assessments. Why? Because you're teaching to the test, and now everything for the student, for the teacher now, the principal, and the district all hinge on the assessment. So who isn't going to teach the test? Because that's the only number that matters. It's the only number to, to advance, to graduate, for your teacher evaluation, for your, for your local district funding, and for now this wonderful report card we have. So the idea that standards equal assessments equal curriculum somehow gets lost in Columbus is, is by choice. And interestingly enough, in about 30 seconds, Bill Gates informs us of the same. Yep. Are you running Windows? Yes. Oh, 
Gates. Yeah, I know. <laughs> 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 he said to me, first, the wonderful response one time, I'm like, what, what else would you expect out of Bill Gates except an employee bad system, you know, that we only pay for? Um, <laughs> well, basically, he says right there, and interestingly enough, he says this to a legislative uh, conference, that when the tests are aligned with common standards, the curriculum will line up as well, and we will unleash powerful market forces. He goes on to say about how wonderful it's going to be when game designers are the ones that are coming up with what, how, what drives our curriculum and how our assessments are performed. I mean, it, it's, it's nauseating to listen to him go on about what is really behind this and where this is leading. And then, again, if you're talking to an audience that doesn't see through it and has no idea what training they're on. The fact that this is state-led, which is you know, their, their mantra in Columbus. The Common Core standards are copyrighted. And Ohio doesn't hold that copyright. Ohio gets no credit for the copyright. And that is where it comes into, it's a little impossible to be state-led or have local control if you are forced to use something that's copyrighted by a national trade organization. The National Governors Association owns the copyright to the Common Core standards. That's why they cannot be changed. We can add 15%, thank you very much, but that won't be tested. But you may not change the standards. The only way you can call it Ohio Core that's on that, sorry, next screen, uh, is to basically adopt them 100%. So they say, say here how the public license belongs to the NGA and the CCSO. No claims can be made to the contrary. Don't put in print that those standards belong to you on any of your uh, consumables or worksheets or anything in your classrooms. In addition to that, they state that per the license, we had to adopt the copyright standards in whole in order to be exempted from acknowledging the copyright. So, but the fact that we adopted them in whole, agreed to adopt them in whole, that now says we don't require you to give us, to give us notice of the, holding the copyright. And that's what allowed them to rename them Ohio Corps. So while that's counterintuitive to most of us, that if you adopt something 100%, you then can rename it, um, that's exactly what the agreement and public license calls for. Common Core does not appear anywhere in Ohio Revised Code. It's Ohio Core, it's College and Career, career, career Readiness Standards, and it's 21st Century Learning. You will never find Common Core. Local control. I, to me, that's akin to saying, you know, we're a sovereign state, too. And, I mean, really, the practical side of this is there is no such thing as local control. There hasn't been, it's, the erosion started with the U.S. Department of uh, Education because of Title, Title I funds and because of the ESEA Act of 1965 from Johnson. But once there was outcome-based education and standards, every, we, we started being calm back, back, in, the, back in 2000 in the, with the Goals 2000 Act. That's where the commonality came in because, again, standards require There's a school option table out on the ODE site, and it actually states that it is compulsory for the public schools to comply with whatever the federal requirements are in order for Title I funding, as well as whatever the state is dictating as their instructional design. Your local district, it it's, uh, would be akin to me saying, you know, I have a choice to pay taxes. Yeah. And they, I have a choice, they can come pick me up and incarcerate me too. <laughs> so the idea, the idea that any local district is going to use or enforce their local control, I mean, it's not practical. They would lose their report card standing, they would lose their funding, and their children would not, their students would not be issued high school diplomas. So, like I said, the, the argument's a 
moot point because it simply is not practical and it's not feasible. This was a slide that Stan Hefner used to present on the, the Common Core, moving Ohio forward. Again, you can find documents and presentations on the ODE site, you used to be able to, um, not anymore, that you use Common Core. But they were very, very uh, strict and made sure never to use that terminology on anything that was going to involve legislation. If you look in the year of 2014-15, and they talk about the local control, uh, local authorities, and that this is just standards and not curriculum, <coughs> phase four wraps it up in the expectations on the state transition timeline. You have implementation of local curriculum and instruction. Sounds like standards are driving curriculum. National and state assessments are fully operational. National assessments. Accountability on the new and national and state levels based on the assessments for the teachers. We are a year and a half away from that. Ohio House Bill 290 is what allowed the student identifiable data to be shared. I want to read to you out of this because it's, I find it amazing. In the Race to Top application, the verbiage reads, in December of 2009, the Ohio General Assembly took the critical step necessary to enable Ohio's student longitudinal data system to meet the final uh, department's recommended essential element and to fully meet all of the elements of the American Competes Act. With the passing of this groundbreaking legislation, Ohio has a plan in place to fully meet all of the ACA elements. I mean, they are bragging about it. They're, they're really <coughs> critical and groundbreaking. They knew what they pulled off, and they actually put it in print inside the application <coughs> because that's going to garner them more points. <laughs> I like their charge just because, you know, I'm, I'm sure in some ways I'm, a lot of this is preaching to the choir, um, but it again, it comes down to the, you know, the fabric of who we are. Are, are we, do we want to be? Do we want our children to be considered a part of a collective? Or are we individuals with individual rights and self-determination? Our educational system determines that outcome. <laughs> this, I'm sure, looks much like the Obamacare flowchart. <laughs> I call it the Gates Education Corporation. Um, but it's the similar similarities are astounding. Um, because each one of these blocks basically is a money handler or a beneficiary of the race to the top application. And for all of the, you know, uh, song about this being for, we're just about better standards. We're just about better outcomes. All those blocks can't find the word student nor parent. Sounds like a lot of people benefiting, but not us. So there was a lot, of, a lot of things going on in June of 2009, um, interestingly enough, or supposedly no one knowing what was coming. Bill Gates held a conference in Oregon. Uh, the paper he wrote up on it or had prepared is actually called the Multi-State Human Capital Development Data System. He talks about the fact that there were three rounds of federal grants that failed to get done what they wanted done. But wow. The stimulus plan is just exactly what we needed, because it's going to assure exchange for state stabilization funds. It's going to give us a stop and flow of human capital information. This, this, this aggregated, I'm sure, you, I'm sure you've heard the term, well, we've been sending aggregate data forever. Yes, aggregate data. You can't find my son Billy in that aggregate data. Well, they're disaggregating it. That's where the student identifiable uh, myth is blown away. And they're talking about it right here. The idea that this was 
not in the works, and no one knew what was going on. I mean, it, get, it comes back to what they claimed, you know, with George Bush. Connect the dots. This isn't hard. It's agenda-driven, special interest. There was, there were no, no citizens, no state legislators that were involved in this. No one opining what was going to be to the benefit of the citizen, the taxpayer, or the student. This was all about big business, corporate ed meets fed ed, and you know, basically the children and the parents be damned. I mean, this, this to me is, is chilling. And out of all of the, quote, buzzwords, out of the race to the top, common core, whatever you want to have, it, to me the one that is the most insidious is that. That somebody's t sitting somewhere who has more power than I do now, is referring to my child as human capital. <laughs> really? I don't think so. This shows the power, again, of the corporate arm that's involved here. When Tom, Governor Tom Corbett pulled Pennsylvania to a pause on Common Core, and that was driven, their pause in Pennsylvania was driven entirely by the teacher, teachers rising up and saying, no, we will not be evaluated based on that. And they threw such a rock at this that Corbett stepped in and said, we'll halt it temporarily. Well, Exxon didn't like that because, you know, this is big business. Education is a $600 billion a year business. And that's why you see all the hands in the pot. And he, they, they basically, again, talk about the talking points. Even the Exxon executive attorney knows exactly what to talk about. <laughs> These were voluntary. They were state-led. These are business leaders and public, uh, private partnerships coming together for the sake of the children. This is rigor. He has all the, all the buzzwords, all the talking points. And he basically threatens them in the last paragraph. You know, you'll either re remember how important these standards are and put this back into place, or maybe you remember how much money, money we give to your libraries, to your hospitals, and to your other institutions. In February of this year, granted it's in draft form, which is uh, noted on there, the U.S. Department of Education issued a 100 plus page report. It's called Promoting Grit, Tenacity, and Perseverance. Again, we're back to how to be successful in the 21st century. Three things that I pulled out of the text within the first few pages. Uh, that the educational data mining and effective computing, how promising they are. They call it data mining because data is where it's at. As we know with Obamacare and what our fears are there, when they have your information, they have your future. Then they go on to, to talk about that it's, you know, it's always a concern because users may, may or may not be aware of what is being mined. <laughs> persistence, which in the title, persistence is now part of the common core state standard for mathematics. When you hear about this fuzzy math, yeah. it's intended mm -hmm. to be fuzzy. It's intended to frustrate the child. That's what they're doing. They're doing that on purpose. And they're actually stating that it is a part of the curriculum. I mean, we're talking about behavior, attitude, and we're talking about emotional health and balance. And they're actually pushing these, the buttons on these little kids. I don't know if some of you saw some of the instruments are also included in this report um, with the biometric measurement. Where they wear pulse readers. Their seats have cushions in them that recognize stress level. Their mouse has a, a stress level indicator on it. While I, to my knowledge, none of those in those fashions are being used in the state of Ohio currently, what I do know is that once the US federal government moves us from draft form to final version and they want Ohio students to have it, we will because they control us. And if we say we can't afford it, we'll have a federal grant. And John Kasich or whoever sit in the governor's office and in the state board 
We'll play for you. This voluntary idea and the fact that you know they're just here to help. You know, they just really they all they care about is the kids and the standards and increasing outcome. Twelve days missing the deadline of September 30th last year. Uh, Governor Brashear gets a letter from the U.S. Department of Education stating, we are about to consider cutting off all of your Race to the Top funding right down to your local districts. You missed your data submission deadline 12 days ago. We want it or we're cutting off your funding. Race to the Top competition, um, it could be any number of things. Uh, th this just happens to be this one. But they all work the same way. We all know this. We know this. At, um, our founders knew this. It's the old, you know, absolute power corrupts absolutely. As well as when you are indebted to assist someone, they own you. So what do the feds do? They come in and they say, what, what's something we can offer? What's something we want? Well, we'll write a federal grant. We'll offer you that green carrot. For, this green carrot, in this case, here's the four things you need to do. All of that information, all of that value, human capital, gets fed to the National Education Association or Department. Then what happens? The next round, which I don't know if you're aware, but in November of 2011, Governor Kasich applied for and received a $70 million Early Learning Challenge Grant. That grant leads even in summary form. This information will be brought forward and passed along to the federal government on every child that's a participant in that program from birth through kindergarten. That was how they got the cradle to career. They didn't do it through the race to the top. They came in with another grant a year and a half later. Governor Kasich applied for it. So now we've got a $70 million grant that is going to expire in a few years. You're going to have all these hundreds and thousands of children in the state of Ohio on this program, all their information being sent to the U.S. Department of Education and Health and Human Services as well. And then someone's going to be barking at the legislature and say, somebody's got to fund this program. We can't have these people standing in the streets. That's why our education budget and our Medicaid budget have both doubled in the last 15 years. So the state-led voluntary race to the top program has brought us national achievement standards, federally directed data mining of our children and families, no consent or authorization required, federally mandated teacher and principal evaluations and personnel structure, and national assessments that drive our local curriculum and our own Ohio graduation <coughs> criteria. It accomplished the fundamental transformation of American education. So what do we have to do? Well, a couple months ago it was we needed a repeal bill. And Representative Annie Thompson got that done for us, along with another uh, 12 co-sponsors. House Bill 237 was introduced in July. Next step right now is we are waiting for it to be, for the hearings to be scheduled in the House Education uh, Committee. The problem there is, anybody that's following this knows, the House and Senate Education Committee chairs are all in on a, uh, for Common Core. Gerald Stubbleton said he will go out kicking and screaming before Ohio repeals Common Core. Peggy Lehner in the Senate, education chair, she has called this fake information, uh, internet chatter, and basically tells us we are in, uninformed and irrational. <laughs> you move on to Republican leadership. We were promised by Speaker Batchelder back before this, our legislation was introduced that we would get a hearing in the House Ed Committee. That never came to fruition. Jerry Stilton did have a, a committee hearing on May 14th. He selected the four, four uh, witnesses that could speak. They were all pro Common Core standards, and we were not allowed to speak, nor 
was there even a moment for public comment. You move on to the governor. The governor is all in for Common Core. Why? And that was one of the puzzling things I had back in February. Why in the world? Well, Medicaid expansion answered that question. Yeah. Uh, there's not a, 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 you know, a greenback debt finance dollar that Kasich doesn't want from the feds. This is, it, it doesn't matter what it is. This isn't based on philosophical approach or you know, uh, whether it's constitutional or unconstitutional. It's, it's, a, it's a federal buck. Dick Ross came from the governor's office, the 21st century learning office, over to be now our state superintendent. When he was sworn into his position, the first, first statement he made, he led with, it is my first and foremost priority to implement Common Core in Ohio. There will be no repeal of Common Core in Ohio, per Dick Ross, the unelected, unaccountable superintendent. So those are the areas where we're going to be concentrating. Each one of us on our own legislator, our own senator, and the education chairs being Stubbleton and Laner, Republican leadership being Batchelder and Senator Faber. Now, I have been told that Senator Faber is at least philosophically opposed to Common Core. Now he's in a, in a tight spot. He's the Senate president. That means he has to be political. He has to basically adhere to the policy or the party line. The nice thing about that, which to me, uh, you know, every, every once in a while, I can't remember the last time I reported this, but the RNC will come through and have some kind of moment of enlightenment and literally an hour before our first forum, which was in Cincinnati on Friday night the 12th, an hour beforehand, the RNC releases the adoption of a resolution categorically rejecting the Common Core. Mm -hmm. So my question to all the Ohio Republicans who can't seem to figure out that this is a federal education takeover, are you left of the RNC? Because they get it. And let's face it, they are hardly some conservative powerhouse. <laughs> and they, you know, I will give them credit. This, this is comprehensive. They go down every part of it and basically say that this is the implications of this. And yet, our governor, our Republican leadership, our Republican legislators, every, every roadblock we have is Republican. Ohio has a, a very unique position we're in that no other state is in that's fighting the Common Core. We have a majority Republican held every state office, House, Senate, state board composition, even though that's quote, not a, a party line. So philosophically speaking, if nothing else, this sh should not be the fight that it's turning out to be. So at a minimum, they should at least have to answer to why they are rejecting the party, national party platform and are backing and supporting Common Core. People say, well, you know, why is it so important? Well, for, I'm sure most of you, certainly for me, we don't give up every moment of our disposable time and all of our family time for just the cause of liberty, there's something behind it. It is always going to be about our stakeholders. <laughs> they talk about the stakeholders that are involved in Common Core, the stakeholders that were uh, contacted, that, that participated. What about us? What about our children? The people at the bottom have gotten all kinds of time. They have been involved from the get-go. This is about us our children, our future, quite honestly, the future of our country, because they are the future. There's no other reason to do this, which is one of the things I find really, you know, infuriating when I have someone in Columbus telling me, you know, you, you have this all wrong. You just do this because you don't like Obama. I've got news for you. I've got better things to do. This is not something I would choose to do. I'm doing this because we have to do it. That's a video as well. Has anybody seen?
seen the David Coleman video? I just have to switch this. Okay, you want to just take a... Yeah. Let, let's break and let him switch. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, sir. Okay, uh, uh, with all this going in, how is this going to affect homeschooling? And why didn't the teachers fight a little harder? You know, they usually you don't like, uh, they don't like anybody to touch anything they're doing. You know, the teachers are usually, usually pretty strong. And my last part is just a com uh, comment. How do you succeed in doing anything by dumbing down the entire education system. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. Right. Yes. The question is with people talking that direction, oh. we can't okay. hear it. We can't. So the first one was, well, how is this going to affect homeschoolers and why? Oh. So we'll deal with that one first. Um, I failed to say that on before. The uh, David Coleman, who was the president of Achieve, who is the organization that wrote the standards, being paid by Bill Gates. He is now the college board president. The college board is in charge of high school or college entrance exams or testing, as well as advanced placement tests. So he is now the gatekeeper. So your homeschooler, who in the state of Ohio is for now, there is Ohio Revised Code that protects them and they can have their own graduation test. They do not have to pass, currently have to, have to pass the AGT. So if that stays in place and they get out of the National Park High School graduation test, they will have to, now, they'll be judged accordingly to a aligned SAT and ACT Common Core Entrance Exam. So they will be at a disadvantage if they were not taught common core methodology and ideology because now their peers coming out of the system are going to perform better even though academically no doubt particularly compared to 
what we know to be the norm for homeschoolers, we're always testing higher than any other educational program. They will be at a disadvantage for college entrance, for college, scholars, college scholarships, as well as for the more, quote, astute institutions. Does this apply to parochial schools? Sure. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let me go back to the current union question. Again, Pennsylvania is an example. The teachers' unions, meaning the leaders, are all in on Common Core. And that's because they're one of those blocks, no doubt, that either got money through Race to the Top or paid like the national PTAs were, millions of dollars by Bill Gates to sell. He did not miss a single uh, faction within uh, what needed to be happening in terms of influencing all of these separate parties. When I went out initially to look at um, <clears throat> why Debbie Terhar was taking the position she was, when I Googled Debbie Terhar and Common Core, up popped numerous um, presentations she made. Every one of them, she was either preceded or seceded by uh, the NEA person. So you have a, quote, Tea Party uh, candidate slash now state board president. And she and the NEA president are on the same page talking the same points, making the same points. That, to me, that, that right there told me all I needed to know. Um, and you've been co-opted. Co-opted, bought, I don't know what, how you want to put it, but you are either benefiting politically or financially if you support Common Core. It always falls into one of those two categories or both in some instances. So the teachers in Pennsylvania rose up. There are a lot of teachers that for the first time, if you're in a non-race the top district, You'd never heard of Common Core until this year. And th there's many teachers that are on fire with this. And then they, of course, are your best teachers. So they'll weed them out because I've spoken to many of them at many of these presentations. <coughs> I would tell you, I'm not doing this. I refuse to, to run my classroom like this. Um, and then your third point was, I'm sorry. Well, I was just making a comment about how do you expect to achieve anything oh in the, the, the world competition by dumbing down the entire populace. Not expected. Yeah, they, they don't want us to. They want us to be no better. You know, it's not fair if we are better than the rest, than third world countries. It's all about equalizing um, on a global scale. <laughs> How is this going to affect the states like Texas, who refuses? How many other states have refused this? There were four refused uh, to, to commit to race to the top. And there, I, I mentioned the uh, Elementary and Secondary Education Act of 1965. That is, that is the title, that was the origin of um, the genesis of Title I funds. The reason for that, that, that was a part of the whole you know, war on poverty. Title I funds were for underprivileged children. There was no reason that children in less affluent districts um, or, you know, household incomes making poverty level or 200% should have to be at a disadvantage. So Title I funds originally, starting in 1965, were intended to go out to those districts or to those students in order to, to, to level the playing field. Again, every, every you know, progressive idea always comes back to harm the very one they said they were, it was designed to help. That was 1965. That act was reauthorized about on a, a schedule about every 10 years. What most people don't realize because of the length of this is, it, it, I don't know what it was called in the 70s and 80s per se, but that's what Acts Goals 2000 was, was a reauthorization of ESA. Then it came along and it was, became what we all know currently no Child Left Behind. That is nothing but the reauthorization of the federal Title I program. What happened was a lot of people blame the fact that that wasn't reauthorized in some capacity, congressionally, as, it, as it's required to be. That's what allowed this vacuum for Obama to come in and start acting unilaterally you know, and doing things by executive order and so forth, because we're, technically we're, we're absent of of the no 
child left behind. Because one of the things I didn't mention, which was of huge value, particularly in Ohio, because we were way behind on making, making these benchmarks uh, for race for no child left behind. You also got a waiver if you adopted Common Core. So Ohio is now under a no child left behind waiver and instead turned that in and now has a exponentially larger unfunded mandate and federally controlled uh, education system. But in that interim, what is happening right now is the House has passed the Student Success Act. That is their version of the reauthorization. That was passed about a month ago. The Senate has passed out of committee their reauthorization of ESA. It's Senate Bill 1094 introduced by Tom Harkin of Iowa, it is common core federalized. There will be no Texas. There's no opt-out. If you want your Title I funds, you, you will comply. Most states, Ohio for instance, we get over, a, see, out of our, out of our $2 billion in annual uh, federal spending in our education budget alone. I believe 1.1 billion of that comes from that act. So if we were to say, you know what, we're, we're not going to participate, and they have federalized Common Core into ESA, we, we will not get Title I funds. So Harkins bill out of committee. If, you know, of course they're assuring me because Senator Rand Paul is on the. This is an example. The acronym for this committee is called HELP. Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions. That is the Senate committee. Senator Rand Paul and uh, Tim Scott of South Carolina both sit on that committee. I've spoken with Rand Paul's DC education aide, um, and she says, you know, there were amendments, but the amendments quite honestly only strengthened it because of the Democrats ruled the committee and they ruled the Senate. But that, this has to go, to, you know, it has to be amended and so forth or conferenced with the House. So that gives me no uh, yeah. assurances at all because we all know what happens to the Republicans and John Boehner when anything goes to conference. Yes. Yeah. So that's where we stand right now is they are, they are moving that forward and in 2010 Obama made the comment that he ex his desire was to tie and make common core standards the requirement for Title I funds. And Senate Bill 1094 does that. So again, they just keep pushing. I mean, they, they are patient. And they, they've moved us this far. That will be the capstone to get truly nationalized. It. OK, you mentioned that uh, the ACT and SATs uh, pertain to the colleges. Do they also pertain to the two universities that do not accept federal funds, Hillsdale College and Liberty? Uh, the, the beauty of Hillsdale and Liberty what, what, what I would like to think, and my, what my prayer is um, in regards to a question, you know, really can we actually repeal this? I believe if we, if we do this right and we commit, first off, I think once you, if you commit fully to something, providence moves with you. This is and can and should be, quite honestly, the turning point to reset. If enough people say, no, we're not going to do this. We pay more in taxes as, as a taxpayer, between property taxes, income taxes, and state taxes. I, I'd almost rest assured the, the highest percentage of tax dollars you pay goes to educate children in the state of Ohio and to the U.S. Department of Education as a percentage of your tax dollars. If enough people say, this system is ours, we, you don't have any power we don't give you. Can you imagine if everybody said, we're out of the game. We're not going to take, take the SAT and the ACT. And we had, instead of one, one Hillsdale, we had 200. We said, we'll determine the students. We know homeschoolers. We don't need David Coleman and the cronies to tell us whether that child can be successful here. We're looking at their transcript. We know how successful they can be. That's, what we, that's who we are. That's what free market is. That's self-determination. We've allowed ourselves to allow the outsiders and the dictators to dictate what is successful. And as long as we allow them to dictate our success and our level of quality,
quality of life? They will. <laughs> so we have to push back because this is it. But to me, the prayer would be that this, this is the path that gets us to that, that we go back to the Hillsdale Academy type of universities. Um, and, but we only get there by denouncing this and saying we won't be wrong. Can parents refuse for their students to take the part? Can they just say, no, I'm not allowed? You can refuse. Um, there are certain stages, like right now, the, the third grade reading readiness. Uh, if you don't pass the third grade reading readiness exam, if you, you know, opt out of that, if you opt out of the park, um, annual assessment, or there's actually four tests throughout the year um, with PARC. <coughs> if you opt out of that, you won't get advanced to fourth grade. <laughs> so, again, you can opt out. Well, sure. It's your choice. You got, I mean, if you could organize three classrooms of third graders not to take, take the test. Then your administrators and your super local superintendent would have to start doing their job. In their defense, I will say, um, in this uh, response or rebuttal is on my website, Ohioans Against Common Core. This is what the Ohio Department of Education put out to all the legislators and state board members um, at the end of April when all the pressure was coming down on them from Everybody's starting to get up to speed on Common Core and what the implications to Ohio were and to our children. Their comments are in black, mine are in red. Mine are also fully sourced on the third page of this document. I stayed in here because they talk about the local control. And Andrew Brenner, who is the uh, vice chair of the House Education Committee, has argued with me in regards to the fact that, that you know what, you should be at your local boards. They're the ones that need to change this. Make them do their job. Well, I probably find that very disingenuous. Mm -hmm. Because who holds the purse strings? Columbus and DC. What superintendent is going to jeopardize their district? Funding, jeopardize their teachers, be insolvent on their contractual obligations to their unions. They can't. So the idea that we're going to go to the local superintendent and bark at him, and he's going to effectively have any choice to change it? No. The, the, the purse strings, as always, particularly in, in a government operation, have all the influence and all the power. So while it's important to go to your local boards and educate them on what is being wrought upon them, and how they basically have been annihilated in terms of any power, they, they really serve no purpose. At this point, at least my local board, for the most part, all, they, all they're there for is every three years to initiate the levy and go out and, you know, pound pavement for um, You know, they, they don't have any power. Sometimes if you, you will uh, approach them that way and say, I'm not only concerned that in the immediate term, but in, unless you guys st stand up and refuse to be controlled by Columbus, you know, really, what are you here for? I mean, don't you find that, you know, kind of abusive? That somebody up in Columbus who doesn't know anything about our district, anything about our teachers or students or parents, are telling you how to do your job? You know, that, that should get them stirred up. They, they sh should stand up. But like I said, until the system has changed, effectively, and in a practical perspective, they can't, they don't really have any control. It's been taken from them. Yes? Yeah, this lady right here is going to try to oh, get I'm your sorry. attention. <laughs> to uh, compile all this information from the children. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons is because they can sell that to advertisers. Mm -hmm. And then they will target your family for whatever you know you seem to be a sitting duck for. <coughs> and so they're not doing anything out of the kindness of their heart either. Okay. But I, in fact, I read a few things about boycotting Google. You know, if you have Google, get rid of it. But when, then you're left with Microsoft, and obviously that's just as bad. Uh -huh. But Worse. is this true? And one of the things that really bothered me was 
the intrusive questions that they used as, uh, you know, has your father touched you or does he hit you? Uh, you know, things like that, that of little children, that you send that out into the, you know, that area right. of computer expertise. Anybody can draw any inference. These kids don't know even what they're saying in answer to some of those questions. Well, the first and off, the fact that they collect give it. dumb answers just to give dumb answers. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, yeah. <laughs> this can end up with the state taking your kids away from you, ultimately. Well, there is, it's provided for. Um, there is a connection between Obamacare, um, the Early Learning Challenge, Early Learning Challenge Grant. Um, it states in there, talks about uh, academic uh, performance, whether it is improving, uh, talks about gra graduation rates for communities, um, and basically that they, if you are participating in this program, they have the authority to come in and intervene and make home visits to make recommendations. <coughs> so in the, the FERPA law, this, the data sharing, collection, um, absolute you know, annihilation of privacy and, and family uh, privacy, is it supersedes HIPAA. They do not have to comply to HIPAA when it involves the educational uh, concerns that they may have. When did that pass? The FERPA rule change happened in May of 11 and became effective law January 12. Arnie Duncan, unilaterally, that should take congressional, uh, it should require congressional authority and be an act, so to speak, of bill. He, he wrote in the rule change, gave a three week uh, public comment period, and said that if it stands after three weeks, Law. And it was. Um, well, you know, it's so bizarre. You know, what do you expect? <laughs> that's it. And, you know, there's no any of us. for minors anymore than in schools. The minor's data, there's no protection anymore. No. They can take your child's data, it will go to park, it will leave park and go to the feds, and the feds can use that in any capacity they, they deem worthy for educational purposes whether it's the Health and Human Services Department, whether it's the Labor Department, whether it is, you know, Bill Gates and Microsoft, because you know, he's going to do an educational study. So, I mean, that's the really um, dark side of this in terms of, and they get you because at surface level, it all sounds wonderful. You know, we're going to bring them into the 21st century. We're going to move, we're going to move our district. We're going to be using all technology. What happens when you lose paper? <laughs> Things ch change, right? So your child is now on all electronic te textbooks, ten, ten, five, ten years from now. And they tell you they read this at school today. And by the time they bring their computer home, it's not there anymore. The, the avenue for the propaganda and indoctrination is endless. Some of the electronic textbooks are being used in New York. Not, not only in terms of targeting later for, um, let's say, Google, in terms of marketing or selling that data, there were actually ads running in the textbooks. <laughs> so how long do you think, considering that Dan Wagner, who ran the uh, data analysis work for Obama for America, I mean, how long before the election propaganda or, or this is what so-and-so will do for you. Or this is what so-and-so is going to do against you. Um, I mean, it, like I said, it, it, it's endless. And once we take it out of print and we put it into electronic form, there's no going back.
they found out it was already signed by Strickland, they just looked shocked. Most people, they took it and they did read. I think there is hope there. Thank you. We don't have much time. I mean, it's going to be. Well, that is one of the things that, um, you know, in, in terms of an example of how upside down this is, one of the representatives that we were trying to uh, get to co sponsor. What kind of promising was uh, Representative Beaky. And he asked for the Legislative Study uh, Commission to do an analysis of Representative Thompson's repeal bill. It states in there that, well, you know, there's some concern because you know, there's been an investment in this um, Common Core. And, you know, that could end up costing local districts. And I read that was real irony because he was using that as a reason why, you know, I, I can't sign on to this. Where was that fiscal analysis and overall analysis prior to signing us up to for this? <laughs> we are talking about a fundamental change in education. We are talking about the second largest appropriation in our budget. And there wasn't one single cost analysis done. Not one. Nor were there, are these standards, were they tested, proven? In fact, the, uh, the geometry standards and the means of, uh, of teaching it as well were used in the Soviet Union and thrown out. Th that's what we have now in the state of Ohio. So again, to dismiss the idea of partisanship, political spin, I don't care if you love Obama and you are big government. I don't know one mom that wants their ch child sitting in a classroom for possibly five or more years only to find out that the standards that they were being taught and used, you know what, these aren't, these aren't so good after all. These are fairly good. Really? It's one thing to have wasted the millions and millions of dollars. It's another thing to have lost five plus years of children's lives. And, you know, it's almost like well, you know, we're just going to go with it. This sounds really good. good. How, how many hundreds, not thousands, of drugs are sitting in the fifth trial level before the FDA will allow them to be used? And yet, the most precious thing and the value that we have in this country are the minds and hearts of our children, and they have been subjected to an untested, unproven educational program. And no one seems to think that that is out of order. Yes. My granddaughter graduated from West Deville South, West Deville South High School this year. And she could not read my letters in cursive. She could not read my notes. She, um, she, she won't be able to read the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, the Bill of Rights. This is West Deville North. This is spread across Columbus, Ohio. These kids cannot read cursive. They can't write cursive. So they're they get cursive literate in that area. Cur so. Cursive is tr uh, the verbiage reads. The cursive is being replaced with keyboard skills. <laughs> now that shows you right there that an educator was not involved, because an educator knows that the formation of words on a keyboard versus not even in print but in cursive are entirely different. There was a there are so many other parts of the brain that are in operation and that are developed through the formation of cursive writing. And it is as basic as if you go back to, you know, it's been compared to, what, what were the cavemen doing? They were writing on walls. You know, that, that is a, a human expression. You know, that's, so the idea that we are, can go to keyboards and not lose something in the process, as well as it brings us to the, the, the history standards in, in Ohio now, fifth grade, they start in the 1900s. They don't cover our founding. They don't cover our constitution. You don't get that till you get to 11th grade history, where they will go over all the founding source documents. Well, that's great. By third grade, they've already been graduated as a global citizen, and they pay far more attention, because that's where the focus is, to Earth Day than President. So that, that argument about this, you know, original source document law that was put in, it's, to me it doesn't, no value.
Our time is getting short, folks, so one more question, and then we're going to have to wrap it up. I was going to say, I, I'll, I'll be happy afterwards. Sure. I okay. know you need to move okay. to the room, but... I, I'm going to homeschool my grandsons. They're not yet old enough to be in school, okay? When they start, would they still be data mined by going, by being homeschooled? The, like I said, there's a few um, statutes that protect homeschool in terms of currently they don't have to take the Ohio graduation test or whatever the equivalent is. Um, but they currently have to go through the motions. You know, a homeschool parent has to go and ask the permission of the low superintendent to the homeschool the children currently in Ohio. <laughs> <laughs> right on.